interesting. So let's give a warm welcome to Alex Wool. Thank you. Thank you, Clem. It's uh, really very excited to be here. And uh, I, I will say that other than I know that Ramsey Clark went to Brazil a number of times, that's the end of my discussion of Brazil. <laughs> there will be no Brazil talk here. Um, which I hope you don't mind, um, but I, I hope you find this, this interesting. Um, anyway, it's, uh, my book, which is pictured here, and I, and I will have a few other slides that you don't have to look only at me, uh, of, of Justice Tom Clark, um, is about uh, Tom and Ramsey Clark. Uh, Justice, Justice Clark uh, served uh, as Attorney General to Harry Truman and then, and then was appointed to the Supreme Court and served until 1967. What attracted me to the book, and I'll just say this very quickly and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards about this, is uh, that he gave up his seat on the Supreme Court so his son could become Attorney General uh, to Lyndon Johnson. And uh, while well, he didn't actually have to legally uh, step down. And, and I found that fascinating and that's what got me sort of focused on the two of them. Uh, as a pair, um, although it ended up being really uh, a, a sort of a dual biography, and, and, and I tried to cross over, and because they were very close but very different in many ways ideologically. Um, but today I want to talk mostly about Justice Tom Clark and about uh, really how uh, justices, uh, himself included, uh, evolve uh, on the court, how they change or whether they change really. Um, at a recent uh, uh, event I attended at the Supreme Court uh, on judicial biography. Uh, I was asked, we were all, all of the, the authors there were asked uh, to very quickly describe the philosophy of the justice we had written about. And um, I realized that was not a very easy thing to do for me. Uh, it's one thing if uh, one of my colleagues was writing about Justice Brennan, he could, he could easily spout that off in a sentence or two. Um, but Justice Clark really was um, <coughs> much more difficult to describe, and, and so that got me thinking a little bit about um, judicial philosophy uh, and, and how he compared with uh, some of the other justices who preceded it and followed him. And so today I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about judicial philosophy uh, and changes of justices on the court, because we hear a lot about, about these things in a very abstract way. So I'm thinking about the Supreme Court today uh, most people think about it in political terms, even though it's supposed to be a non-political institution. Um, we think about, we, we hear it described by the media, we hear liberal justices, conservative justices, um, and sometimes it gets a little more specialized. We say strict constructionist, whatever that means, uh, living constitutionalist, um, and, and then these terms are thrown about, but, but ultimately it comes back to a very political, oh, he's, he's, he's liberal, he's conservative, she's liberal, she's conservative. Um, and sometimes you actually hear a, a phrase uh, called judicial activist, and uh, that's, that's one that I, I, I step back a little bit about because while it used to be called judicial activist, the Warren Court, the, the court from, headed by Chief Justice Warren, during the most during the 60s, was responsible for the Brown decision and, and up and up through uh, the late 60s, um, was seen as by by conservatives as a very activist court. Now today we have a much more conservative court, and they are being targeted and, and said to be uh, uh, conservative judicial activists. So I'm going to steer away from that a little bit in terms of uh, because that can be a very subjective discussion. But one thing that we can say for sure about today's court is that it is very divided ideologically. Um, on the one side, uh, and we'll just, for, for lack of a better term, we'll call it the conservative side, uh, we have Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, Thomas, Alito, and Kennedy. On the other side, the four, the minority, we have Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. And there is one, one thing, you can, you can say that, uh, you know, as, as uh, Many people do. Oh, Justice Kennedy sits in the middle. Everything he does decides the way the way the court will go on a big decision, and that's absolutely true. But there's no doubt about it that he still fits in the conservative side. Now there are differences among the conservatives. Justices uh, Scalia and uh, Thomas, for instance, are very different than Justice Kennedy in terms of philosophy, and there are differences among the liberals as well. Um, but one thing that you can say about each of these justices. 
and you, this is not always the case, is that the conservatives were appointed, and the ones I de described as conservatives, were appointed by Republicans, and the liberals were appointed by Democratic presidents. And that doesn't always happen. In fact, just so recently, when Justice Stevens stepped down, he was seen as a liberal, was appointed by uh, President Ford. But that, today we have a very clear identification with the presidents uh, that appointed these people. Now there are other factors that go into what defines and what shapes a justice. Uh, Professor Akil Mars lecture uh, a couple weeks ago, um, he focused on where the justices come from, and he described how many, most of the justices today in, in recent years have come from other lower federal courts, or sometimes state courts, but mostly federal courts, as opposed to uh, in the past where they would come from the Senate, from uh, the, just being prominent lawyers, and that makes a big difference as well in terms of um, how, how, how a justice decides cases. Now, there's nothing wrong with the fact that a Democratic president appoints a uh, a justice who then sort of follows his, his ideology. Um, that's generally what the Founding Fathers intended. It was a lifetime appointment, and uh, they, were, they were not seen, to, while they were, the re reason they got a lifetime appointment was so that they could speak independently and decide cases independently. They obviously had a record usually on which they were appointed, and so uh, that doesn't really, uh, doesn't really surprise you that they would stick to it. And there are relatively few cases of justices sort of spurning the president's, uh, the philosophy of the president who appointed them. Um, let me give you a few examples before I turn to Tom Clark. Um, David, some re more, more recent examples, I should say. Uh, David Souter, for example, was appointed by the first President Bush um, on the say-so of, of a Republican senator, uh, John Sununu, who said, he's one of us, don't worry, he's good, he'll be, he'll be fine. And he got on the court, and he was very independent, and eventually really joined the liberal bloc, and was a big disappointment to conservatives who thought that this was gonna be the chance for them to, to take over the court and change rulings left over from the Warren Court era. Um, now, how, why that happened? Well, there's a number of, you know, no one knows for sure. Some people suggest uh, that it was, he was just so ticked off by Justice Scalia that he you know, felt that Justice Scalia needed opposition. Others said that, well, no, it was really the person who preceded him in that seat, Justice Brennan, who was still alive and sitting at, uh, at the court, who befriended him and, and kind of brought him into that orbit. Um, but really, I mean, this is who Justice, uh, who Justice uh, Souter was. He was a very independent thinker. Um, he was, you know, a New Hampshireite and uh, wasn't about to be pigeonholed into one philosophy or the other. Um, there are some others uh, in recent memory who, who've sort of fallen into this, uh, into this area. Justice Harry Blackman, who was appointed in the, in the early 70s by uh, Richard Nixon, um, again, following that Warren Court era. He was appointed at the same time as Chief Justice Berger. In fact, they were both from Minnesota. They were called the Minnesota Twins. Um, and, uh, Justice, and both of them were seen as fairly conservative, which is uh, to follow in, in Nixon's law and order uh, promise uh, which actually was a campaign against Ramsey Clark, in part, who was Attorney General at the time. But uh, the, um, and, and so he got on the court, and in, in most of his opinions, Chief Justice Berger was, was fairly conservative. Uh, but, but Harry Blackman came, began to uh, sort of veer a little bit to the left, and particularly when he wrote the Roe v. Wade decision, because in part because of his background as a, a lawyer for the Mayo Clinic. Um, and he ended up, uh, that sort of defined him, and he ended up becoming much more becoming a, a solid member of the liberal bloc. Um, there have been others over time, uh, Justice Hugo Black, uh, who was, uh, you know, when he was nominated, he was a senator, again, with a different, little different background. He was a liberal senator, strong backer of FDR's New Deal. Um, but he, uh, as it turned out during his uh, nomination, it turned out that he was a KKK member, he was from Alabama. And uh, big, uh, big uh, brouhaha, he came on the radio, he did a national address, he was uh, confirmed nonetheless, I mean, everybody in Alabama was in the KKK, is what he said, essentially. It's just something you did. Um, and uh, as it turned out, he was one of the most liberal justices on the court, teaming with Justice Douglas and others on the Warren Court, at least until the very end of the Warren Court, when he sort of shifted <coughs> back and became a little more conservative, um, sort of as a, as a response to uh, a lot of the, uh, the protests and things that were going on in the 1960s. So 
But, but on the whole, these types of examples are, are fairly limited. And that brings us to Justice Clark. And um, let me give you a little background on Justice Clark. I just happened to have to, to know that. Um, spent a little time on it. And uh, since, as I said, since uh, Akhil Amari gave a bunch of promos for his book, I'm just going to say I will be selling the books after. <laughs> so I thought it was only fair. Um, the, um, so that's Justice Clark when he was when he was a little bit younger. That's actually probably when he was Attorney General. And uh, w William Douglas, who was uh, probably one of the, if not the most liberal member ever to sit on the court, and certainly one of the strongest judicial activists to ever sit on the court, um, said that Justice Clark, who, and he sat with Justice Clark on the Warren Court for a good number of years, had the indispensable capacity to develop so that with the passage of time, he grew in stature and expanded his dimensions. When he first came on the court, Justice, Justice Douglas sent a note to Hugo Black saying, I don't know if we can do this, I may have to just resign, because he was so scared, and you'll hear why, uh, based on Justice Clark's background. But to fully appreciate Tom Clark's evolution, um, and evolution can be a code word for shift, and some people don't like that. But uh, to fully appreciate it, let me give you a little background on him. He grew up uh, in, in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, his, his family was actually from Mississippi. His grandfather was a, a Confederate captain who died on the battlefield, uh, but didn't actually get to see Tom Clark's father. He's, his, his wife was pregnant at the time. Um, and. Uh, he ended up, uh, the family moved uh, to, to, uh, to Dallas, and Tom Clark's father was a, was a well-known lawyer in Texas, but also a notorious racist. Um, and so he grew up in a very, not only segregated environment, Dallas is a very segregated city, but he grew up under the tutelage of a father who, while a very good man in terms of law, had unbelievably racist views. In fact, published a uh, one of the one of the um, uh, he published a speech that he was so proud of. He actually published it, and it just goes through the you know why you know the the races are unequal and why they should remain separate. And, and it was it was quite remarkable. He was it, it was not you know it wasn't a hidden type of thing. Um, and and he, both he and, and the mother uh, harbored a suspicion of anything northern. He and Tom Clark's mother. And in fact, you couldn't mention Abe Lincoln's name in the House, um, which ironically was uh, the same thing that happened with Harry Truman. Uh, so they had a, they <coughs> a bond with that as well. His, his mother also would not mention uh, Harry Truman's name. I mean, would not mention Abe Lincoln's name. So he, he, uh, he grew up there, though, and he went to law school. Um, he actually um, wanted to join the, the Army, but came in a little bit too late for the war. Uh, for World War I, uh, but he ended up joining the ROTC and then shifted over. Um, he became a very successful lawyer, developed a connection with big oil down there, um, was actually worked as a prosecutor, as assistant prosecutor in, in Dallas, um, and became very good friends with the prosecutor who ended up running for governor. Uh, but needless to say, he was very well connected uh, in Texas. This was a, something that continued throughout his entire life. Um, he, he, he could have actually been a very big political figure in Texas, but he, for some reason he wanted to go to Washington. He wanted to be in the federal government. And so he used his connections to get a position, an appointment, uh, in the Roosevelt, Roosevelt administration. And I should say that one of the, uh, one of the uh, connections that he had, he became very good friends early on with a young Lyndon Johnson. Uh, they were close friends throughout. <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the life. This is a dinner that they had back in uh, in uh, Washington. That's Tom Clark. Uh, that's LBJ, the first one over there. And next to LBJ is Tom Clark's wife. Um, but they they socialized. They wrote each other letters. They gave each other gifts. And one of the interesting things, if if you've read anything about LBJ, you know, know that he was uh, a uh, I don't want to say gratuitous thank you note writer and. Uh, um, and, and Tom Clark was the same way. He would send notes saying, you know, what a you know happy New Year. Thanks for the you know sending little birthday gifts. And he managed to keep these relationships. He was he was just unbelievable in terms of understanding how the process worked. But I mean, he was also just a very nice guy. I mean, there's no no two ways about that. It wasn't a manipulative thing necessarily. Um, so he went to D.C. and he was he got himself appointed. Uh, what he came to in 1937. And he thought he was going to be uh, Assistant Attorney General. 
and he left his family back there and they were going to join him. He gets here and it turns out that he actually misunderstood he was an assistant to the Attorney General, which was a very diminutive position compared to what he thought he was getting. Uh, and he ends up going into the war risk litigation section uh, and he's buried in what's called the graveyard, or the, war, sorry, the war insurance section, the graveyard of the Justice Department. So he really was very unhappy his first few years there. Um, but he ends up uh, joining the antitrust division, which is really what he wanted to do. And um, that's, that's him sort of after he's, he, you can see he's a little prouder at that point. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you'll notice, by the way, the bow tie. I'll get to that in, in a little bit. You won't find a picture of Tom Clark with a regular tie ever. Um, but he joins antitrust and he befriends Thurman Arnold, who was the then head of the antitrust division, um, who also later became a federal judge, an author, a uh, renowned legal figure, um, and also ultimately created, uh, uh, was one of the founding partners of Arnold uh, uh, Fortas and uh, Arnold Fortas and Porter, Justice Fortas. Then leaving, it became Arnold and Porter. It still exists as one of the major law firms today. Um, but they became very close. Uh, uh, Thurman Arnold loved Tom Clark. Was really sort of almost a mentor to him, um, and uh, he loved antitrust, and he did very well in it. He was all, the reason he was pulled from obscurity was he had was one of the few lawyers who at that time had any trial experience. And they really needed, given all the litigation that was going on with the war, uh, they needed trial lawyers. And so he, he demonstrated, he showed, he showed himself to do that. So he was sent uh, out to head up the West Coast, the California, in California, the West Coast Office of the Justice Department's Antitrust Office. And he gets out there in 1941, or 1940, and he's doing a wonderful job. He's flying up and down the coast. He's got a whole staff. His family's living with him. Uh, in uh, actually, Ramsey stayed back in, Cal in in Texas at this point. Uh, this happened a lot of times for two close guys. Um, they didn't actually spend a lot of time together as as uh, as uh, father and son because of their their differing schedules. But he, there, he's out in California. He lives down the street from uh, <coughs> from uh, George Burns and Quincy <coughs> Allen. He's having a ball out there. Um, and uh, then comes uh, December of 1941, and uh, suddenly we're at war. And the, so the, the Attorney General, obviously things change out there, there's a big suspicion of uh, anything Japanese, and there's a big Japanese population. Uh, the the um, uh, Attorney General is very worried, uh, is very worried that there is, if, the Attorney General, sorry, Francis Biddle, is very worried that there is going to be a, a takeover and a you know, the, the, what's going on in Congress, the, the, the individual rights are going to get totally squashed, um, which is, in fact, of course, what happened. But, um, and so the army has taken over, essentially, the government there. Um, and so he appoints Tom Clark, because he's the most prominent guy out there, he appoints Tom Clark to be the civilian liaison to the army for all of the security things that are going on. And his goal was for Tom Clark to sort of stand up for the, the individual rights, the human rights of, of the citizenry out there. Well, Tom Clark was probably the, the wrong man for that job. He was very deferential to the military, and he, he was a young guy, and he, to be honest, was very worried about the security issues. Um, and so he ended up uh, really sort of just falling over for the Army. Uh, he ended up 